Welcome to Open Source for Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by researchers for researchers. My name is Arvon. And I'm Abby. And we're your hosts. Every other week, we interview an author or authors today published in the Journal of Open Source Software, also known as JOSS. Yeah, this is episode five. We spoke with Guy and Luis, and you'll hear a longer intro about the two of them. But I thought this was a very fun conversation. It was fun. I think we've learned as budding podcasters that if you invite two people, you seem to talk even more. So it's a longer one, but it was fun. We covered a lot of ground. I think one of the things that I learned and reflected on as I was listening, especially to Key Talk, but also Louise, was there's this work that gets done, the instrumentation work, the low-level software that's used to operate these incredibly important instruments. Oceanography is a pretty impactful research area, especially in the, these times of climate change and all the things, the reasons we need to care about the ocean. This was a really interesting conversation to have and learn about the hardware and the software and how they, that work is divided up in their research areas and also just get to hear people who are excited about Rust, which is kind of fun to listen to people who are passionate about programming languages. What about you? It was really interesting to, to hear their story going through this Rust implementation of an existing library. Just they're such yeah. strong Rust advocates. <laughs> they're ready to go yeah. through it. Yeah. It was fun also just to hear their journeys through open source and implementing this. And I learned a bit about yeah. oceanography. Yeah, let's play the interview. Yeah, let's go for it. Today we're chatting with Guy Castello and Louise Herbert about their paper, Gibbs Seawater Oceanographic Toolbox of TS10 implemented, I think importantly, in Rust, although the importantly bit isn't in the title. <laughs> I asserted that just for my own satisfaction. Guy, Louise, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your home institution and whereabouts you're based. I'm Guilherme Castellon, just, just Guy. Uh, I'm an oceanographer, currently at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And before I was in uh, the instrument developing group, which is related with when this uh, project started. And now I'm working with more with uh, machine learning and climate. Nice and Louise. Yeah, so hello everyone. I'm Luis. I, I'm a computer science PhD at UC Davis. I work with bioinformatics mostly. I've been doing Python for 20 years, doing Rust since 2017. And for my PhD research, I just love going into public genomic databases and downloading petabytes of data and making them searchable and useful. I met Guy when we both worked in Brazil at the Brazilian Climate Research Institute. So I have a history of a bit of climate models. So that's my connection with oceanography nowadays. It's kind of through Guy. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, now, now that Louise mentioned that, that, that's interesting. One of the first open source package that I wrote was an old version of this package in Python. This back like. 2002, 2003 was one of my first submission to, to PyPy. Full circle. And I think that's a nice segue. I, I was going to ask a fun icebreaker question. Tell us a little bit about your open source journey. So, Guy, it sounds like you have a bit of a background doing open source. Yes. So, that, that started with around 2002, 2003, mostly Python at that time, learning how to do it. One thing that's interesting on this whole process is how the community change, right? At that time, it was hard to, 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 to do open source, like uh, people didn't know how to, to use it well. Sometimes people would write to me complaining, like really pissed, oh, there is an error on, the, on, on your open source that you're making free for us to use. <laughs> like was a selling product, right? I'm like, wait a minute. I think that still <laughs> happens. I'm like, go on. Oh, that is much better now. But I, I think just the community wasn't prepared, they didn't understand how, how things work, right? There were less material for us as well. like. For me, building stuff, you have to kind of figure out how to do open source by ourselves. Now there's so much teaching, right? So much guidance on the importance of doing documentation or testing or how to handle the community. The code of conduct, <laughs> how you should not behave, was, was, was a big change. It's great. I think we, we have things that we can improve, but was uh, was a great progress. Nice. And Luis, how were you introduced to open source? So in Brazil, there was this kind of big festival, which was called FISL, F-I-S-L. It's the International Festival of Free Software. And it happened on the capital of my state in Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul. So since I was in high school, like in 2000, I would go with some friends to this festival in the capital. And it was like 5,000 people, the largest ones, and just go around 
there were booths for the community, like for Linux installations. And so it was a place that I learned a lot. And then I started tinkering at home with installing Linux in my things and so on. Then in 2005, it was my first time releasing open source software. I started working at another research institute in Brazil that was doing research for agricultural purposes. I got into as a research intern and was kind of rewriting a package that was in Windows. And they promised on the funding that it would work on Linux, but no one had work on that. And it was a C++ code base. And I was like, how do I port this thing over to run on Linux? So that's when I started using Python and a lot of uh, GStreamer to handle the, the video components of the system. I learned Python a bit before, but that was the point where I started really going deep into Python. And then in 2007, I think was the first time I attended the Brazilian PyCon. And that was like, just amazing. Like the Brazilian Python community is so nice. And I just learned so much from the community interactions, but also how to develop software. And because of that, I ended up doing my PhD was because of this Python community connection also. I found Titus not because he was a professor. I found him because he was doing a lot of testing in Python. That's super cool. And this is Titus Brown, of course, who does a lot of open source work himself. I have a side question. I was going to ask you something different, but I'm going to have to ask you, Louise, because I think your number is going to be higher than mine. How many distinct versions of Linux have you installed in your life? Like different flavors of Linux? Because <laughs> you're describing a period where I feel like I was reinstalling my machine every two weeks with different distros. Yes. I was trying them all out. I'm just curious if you had to pick a number, how high is that number? I would probably say 15. The first time yeah. I nuked the Windows system in my computer and lost <laughs> all my family data was with a Brazilian oh, no. distribution called Connectiva which was derived from Red Hat, so. Yep. Yeah. What about yourself, Key? Do you have a number, top of mind? Uh, a little bit less than that, maybe, maybe like 10, because it, I would install and restall and restall. Okay, now I figure it out. And then next yeah. week, I just install the same one again. But if yeah. my first, I think my first distro was Slackware. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it was quite intensive, <laughs> quite a lot of time. What about you, Abby? Have you, have you got scar tissue from those experiences? Yeah, I had, I had that period in my life. I think I'm only at two, though. I don't think I okay. explored two too far. I really liked Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, I remember mine's probably under 10, but I do remember being very proud of an uh, install that I'd done, maybe like Yugi, where you like install it and then you're like, oh, no, next time it'll be perfect. So you like start again. And then I went and talked to some of my computational chemistry friends and they're like, well, if you really want to do it properly, you got to install Gen 2. I was like, oh my God, what is this? And you like compile your own kernel to start with. I was like, I was like this is insane. And I remember spending like four days compiling like KDE or something, like whatever. And then I, but I'd set the flags wrong and it just didn't work. <laughs> I had to go back to the start. Anyway, that was during my PhD. So you, that's, you know, it turns oh. out I had some spare time during my PhD. Anyway, I, that was a side note. Yeah. <laughs> I, I loved Gen 2. Was the end Likewise. of my PhD was, was everything that I used like, you feel like you take all the juice from the machine. Why? Well, yeah, exactly. And it's exactly. a mess. It's a mess to install the first time, but then to keep up, as long as you don't accumulate too much, just compound yeah. the yeah. background. I didn't feel that much. Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. Okay, right. Well, I will bring us back to topic. Sorry for uh, distracting everyone talking about their favorite Linux flavor from 20 years ago or whatever, but that was actually really fun to hear that. So I wonder if we could just start, go back to this paper, this submission and this software, you could start by telling us about Teos 10. Can you say a bit more about the sort of origin story of this software and why you started the project? Let, let me talk about a little bit of, of uh, GSW and then we move to, to how we start. So the GSW is, is the idea behind actually is we measure a bunch of things in, in the ocean, right? And there are some properties, for instance, one, one example, dancing in the ocean is really important to be able to explain and understand why water going one direction or the other, right? But it's quite difficult to measure directly in the ocean. So it's way more efficient to measure all the properties and guess what is in this. Usually our, the instruments that we use measure pressure, conductivity, and temperature. And with that, we can guess pretty well what is the density. I guess this is the most common application on the oceanograph with GSW. And what GSW provides, which is important to make clear, what we did was the softer part for the rust, 
But there is a whole scientific community behind that actually proposed the relations, right? This is very important and this is distinct. We build a software, but we have no credit for the science built behind that proposed those equations and those parameters. But what this, this great large community did was proposing relations. If I have these three measurements, conductivity, pressure, and temperature, what is the best gas for things for that place? And our electronics measure the, the, the three things. So that said, GSW is a collection of those relations. And one big thing from the old version, the US 80, is that it was proposed in a such way that's consistent. Before, the regressions were done like independently, so they, they could have inconsistency, especially on, on deeper, deeper ocean. So the new one is, is a fully consistent formulation based on, on Gibbs. Yeah. I, I think I stopped here. It's, it's way more than that, but that, I think it's enough to give a picture. How we start is a little bit different. I'll let Luis tell this. <laughs> well, before we move on, GSW, that's the Gibbs seawater. Yes, yes, yes. I did have a question around how you're getting these measurements. Is there a ship with sensors out there? Good question. In the old times, oceanography was, was initially done with bottles. We could just measure first at the surface, and there were special bottles that we could dive them, and they would close in a certain depth. And then you bring these bottles back, so we would sample water from 100 meters, 500 meters, 800 meters, so you could measure, oh, this is the salinity down there. There are special thermometers that once they flip, they would lock, so you leave it stabilized there. They flip, they lock, and bring it back, oh, this was the temperature down there. But this is very inefficient, right? Hours and hours to, to make a few more errors. Nowadays, we work with electronics. And the principle of the electronics that work in big ships what are called brown sets, and, and these are like package of instruments, like it's huge, it's huge, full of instruments that you lower in the ocean with a big ship, or the instruments that I usually uh, use to work with small robots that will dive by themselves. The principle is the same, and the common measurements are, as I said, pressure, temperature, and conductivity. They record that, bring it back, and then how we guess. There's just the connection. So the, we have the electrons. The electrons is still, there are errors on that. So we still measure with bottles nowadays that we can bring to the lab and measure with very high precision and calibrate the electronics. And one of the ideas of, of this uh, library from the start was to be able to bring more autonomous decision-making for the sensors or the robots. So if you wanted to do like, to bring machine learning decision to the firmware, of these robots, we need to have a more flexible language, right? Like like rest of the thing. Robust, need to be robust because we just drop these robots. Maybe they spend months and months by themselves. So we don't want bugs on that, like segmentation fault in the middle. <laughs> so if, if you want to bring more decision making on, on, on these, we need to, to build a firmware with a language that, that had more uh, resource. And then these instruments, they need to make sense of the sensors. For instance, what is the density, what is the pressure, where I am? Yeah, do I want to go up or down? And, and this would be the idea of, can we create a resource to produce a firmware for those instruments or sensors to make more autonomous decisions? Yeah, so I, I think the origin story on this is a bit on like how I found out about Rust. During my PhD, still to this day, I work on a piece of software called Sour Mesh. That is the thing that allows me to do these comparisons on public genomic databases. But a big component on that is that I want to be able to run part of the software in the browser. And Sour Mesh used to be a Python and C++ code base. And in 2017, the best option was to use mscripten to bring Sour Mesh to the browser or to rewrite everything in JavaScript. I tried in JavaScript, didn't work out because of like how we are dealing with integers. Then I was, okay, if I do mscript, I really complicate the build system for Sour Mesh. And then I was like, oh, there's this other language called Rust that's kind of like C++, but has packaging, has like integrated testing in the tooling documentation and so on. So I was like, I'll try it out. And I've been doing Rust things. I really like the, the language. And then I started evangelizing the language around because that's what you do when you learn Rust, apparently. I talk with Guy and then Guy started doing his things. In... Is that Rust swag that you've got there, Guy? Because it's a crap. <laughs> the Rustations. Nice. Yeah, for anyone not watching the video, <laughs> Guy and Luis are both holding up their Rust swag. 
I do have a very soft spot for rest. Yeah. So then what happened is that in September of 2020, we started doing weekly rust meetings to talk about rust and like figuring out things together or like if we found something interesting, like we would show to each other. And then we started working on small projects to work with the language other than the work that we were doing in our jobs. It does seem like Rust gathers strong advocates, right? It feels like there's a lot of junior advocates out there as well, right? People who adopt new languages. Well, I guess new languages only yeah. survive and grow if people get excited by them, right? Okay. Except Full disclosure, I've not written a single line of Rust ever, so maybe I should fix that now. It seems like I've got one out on this podcast. <laughs> one comment about the story that we start. So I'm an oceanographer, right? Full, full oceanographer, like undergrad, master's, PhD, everything. I always enjoy coding, but there are a lot of holes on my education on, on computer science. Uh, on the other side, Luis is, is, is a full computer scientist. What's cool, like on the time of the, when we work at the climate model, he was recently graduated. But he was teaching us a lot of things. And these meetings uh, was a huge impact. Like I, I imagine how much the scientific community could benefit of this, which was essentially pericoding, right? But it goes all the way from, oh, how do you set up your VI? How do you manage this? How you do that? And it turned me so much more efficient. These meetings were me way more than Rust and updates the week <laughs> than what was happening on the things. But there is a lot of learning, and I think that the scientific community can improve a lot if people practice more that. You're preaching to the converted here, but I love to hear it said. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, uh, thanks for noting that. Okay, so I wanted to just pivot a little bit to audience here. So you're know, writing software, it sounds like solving a problem that you faced yourself. You know, you understand the problem well, but who's your sort of target audience? Is it people like yourself, Guy? How broad is the user base here for this software? That's a very interesting question. So the, this library in Rust is not directly impacting like the community of, of Python users. It, it might one day they flip instead of based on the C now flip to be based on, on our Rust one. But I don't think this is for the general scientific community. It can be a behind the scenes, right? Like as, as a crunchy number, efficient and robust crunchy number. But the way how I see this more like fear more developers for sensors or high performance computing, anything. So th th that's what Rust brings special, right? Is the efficiency, which means faster, but also demand less resource. So if you're doing a firmware for a small sensor, a small robot, that's very helpful. If you're trying to crunch numbers in a fast computer and trying to do that faster, that that's the place. But most of the community nowadays, I think use Python. And I don't think we are, we are replacing Python. I, think. I don't think we should. Yeah. It's, it's a diff so I think, I think a small niche, but very important one. And maybe a strong one behind the scenes. We still have a wrapper in Python like we do on the, on the repository. Uh, but yeah, not directly for the, for the large community. What, what do you think, Luis? Well, on the question on the target audience, I mostly work with bioinformatics. So like I'm not the target audience for this library. So people that are working with oceans or this sort of measurements is the target audience. But as Guy said, there is a big spread also on that one, like, which niches are you covering? Like, are you doing data analysis or do you want to deploy this like on firmware to run something? Yeah, different software for different situations. Hearing you talk about this sort of picking the right tools for the right problem is actually reminding me a little bit of how astronomy works, where you have like very strong culture of instrument builders, people who are building the thing that will attach to the camera that will then go measure some fundamental constant about the universe. And there's all the software that gets built for that. And in the most extreme settings, those instruments go into space, maybe like deep ocean work, I would imagine in oceanography, you know, they're remote, the instruments. And then there's also this sort of separation of, well, that's not the right tools for the people who are going to want to use that data and do their analysis. And so then it might be much more like scientific Python stack, notebooks, maybe popular machine learning libraries, that kind of thing. I have a question in there actually, which is, does oceanography have a strong instrumentation culture? Like are there people who just build instruments and think about that? Is that a career path that people follow in oceanography or do people usually do multiple different things? Yes, I think there is. When we started this library, I was working the instrument development group 
of scripts. <laughs> oh, very so good. Just, there you go. Yeah. There's the answer. <laughs> Just dedicated for that, and and some of the the, the standard instruments uh, used today, they they started there. Yes, there is this this path. I agree with you. I agree with everything that you said, and 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 they are quite different. I think it's quite difficult to to do both. There are few people, few genius that they can walk in both ways, but I don't think normal people like me should aspire that. <laughs> And I also think one of the, the issues on that is the way the scientific community recognizes this, right? And, and by the way, I think that's important job that JAWS is doing. If you dedicate too much time developing software, improving software, like me, I was a oceanographer, and going towards the software development, if you invest too much time in this to do a good job, of course you're going to publish less if you're a normal person. But the scientific community has trouble to recognize hand. It still have. We are proving. We still have some ways, but we are much better already. And I think the contribution of Jones is critical about that. So there is a, a way for you to produce a software that's reproducible, that people can understand how to do it, that's tested, and you can have a DOI in recognition. Look, I wasn't fully on it. I was working. <laughs> I was doing something. Maybe my PhD did a camera with all these papers, but look all the things that I built that people are using. Sorry, I think I went a little bit off your question. No, but I think you're but, touching on some important topics. In astronomy, speaking from my experience watching colleagues, the challenges that software engineers face in academia is quite similar to the instrument builders, which is they're doing work that can result in papers, but it's often not immediate. And it's different kind of work. Like if you build an instrument that a thousand people use over the next 10 years, over the next 10 years, they're probably going to cite you every time. So Oh, the long lead is great. You get tons of citations yep. eventually. But yep. if you spend eight years working out how to build that instrument, you might publish like one or two conference papers in that very long period. And so you don't look like a normal researcher because you're making something. And I, I'm always struck by that sort of similarity between software and hardware. And people especially, I think, face some of the same problems because we built universities around this idea that you're going to publish research all the time that's yeah. the only way that yeah. we can judge somebody's output so it's interesting hearing you talk about it i think the most critical part is is it could be better the recognition of, of the leading developers but it's hard to hide that achievement right the part that i'm most concerned is that those things are not built by one person there is like a community doing little contributions, right? And these little contributions are the ones that I think disappear. I think uh, we, we should have a better way to recognize that and give a chance. So the, the point is not the ego side, right? We, we leave that aside, but when I mean recognize is give the resource for that person to keep going. Maybe during the PhD, we spent one year developing this thing that was the important component of a bigger thing. We should put some money for this person. Let's go for another year, produce something else. You're doing great. Keep moving on. Yeah. That's when I mean by recognition. I don't know if Luis wants to add something about this. Yeah, I, I will say that we tried with not Sour Mesh, but another software in the lab to hack this publication system and be like, every person that submits a pull request is an author in the paper. And that also led to so much discussion being like, oh, but this person just fixed a typo. And yeah. it, it's still software centric in a sense, because there's a lot of people that are also scientists that are not going to program something but they come with use cases we discuss a lot on how to implement things and they don't have a pull request to go as an author software credit is, is complicated i agree you use the exact word my favorite word in life these days is it's complicated and i think this is a good example of that yeah and i'm editing but an I... episode we recorded but hasn't been released yet where we do talk about how documentation is often more important than the software itself for the humans using it so right, that right. contributions to documentation is also really important. I think the DOIs, like the DOIs are not perfect at all, but I think they address part of these with the creators category and contributors, right? So you, you still can add people that give some contribution, but not in the level to be a creator and an author, right? And you can move things. I think I like that solution, which by the way, I have a read called Inception with explaining how to use the dot Zeno do. So how you can automate releases if you link up Zeno to... Oh, nice. It'd be cool to get a link to that project. If you have some examples, we can put it in the notes. So I know we've talked a bit about Rust and you're huge fans of Rust, um, but can you tell me a bit about the advantages of using Rust in this rewrite and uh, like why you chose that? So 
I, I'll go answering that. I think the main benefit of this is that when we started working on implementing this library, we wanted to have something that was maintainable over time, but also as close as possible to the equations that are in the scientific paper, because those equations are complicated and have a lot of parameters. So going with Rust has this benefit that it's a low level language performance wise. So we could do a lot of parameters and the compiler usually does a very good work of optimizing all that away across function calls and so on. But also because it's a, a low level language in that sense, it's a kind of a dropping replacement to a C library, for example. So we can avoid this practice of rewriting everything in Rust or like making all the other projects that use GSWC have to fix a lot of stuff to be able to support this. And we could benefit like the other implementations of GSW that are usually based in, in the C version to benefit from our work. And a comment on GSW, GSW, the, the reference implementation is in MATLAB. And there is a version written in C that's used by other languages like Python and R and Julia to have all these features available. So what we were aiming for is to not replace GSWC, but be an alternative focus on keeping compatibility with the other libraries, but also increasing the correctness of the code and how we test, how we document, how we do everything. And Rust was a good fit for that. I love it. Yeah, that just, just reinforce, agree with everything. For me, two things that, that really raise here is, is uh, first is the low level because the interest of going to firmware, right? So the same code that go run my laptop and on HPC, I can use to structure a firmware. And the second, as Luis said, is the zero cost abstraction that we can write the functions as close to the papers as they are. So it's very easy to compare, to check, to validate without compromising the performance because the compiler will then organize the whole thing for efficiency. There are a lot of advances, but these are the two ones that most attract me. Awesome. Okay. So just a little bit of pivot to talk about JOS for a few. So I think your paper was one of the first of 2024s to be published. So congratulations. For well, I guess maybe you would rather have published as one of the last ones in 2023. <laughs> I have no idea. But I was curious if you could just say a bit more about why you published in JOS. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but what the motivations were for that and how was the review experience? Anything particularly of note that for both of you during the review? So it's, it's not my first paper at JAWS. I think Louise as well, right? We, we reviewed papers there as well before. We, we, we really appreciate JAWS. And there are several reasons to, to publish with JAWS. And, and one of them is, well, I'm having trouble to which one to say first. One of them, I think, is the culture, right? It's, it's different than a typical review on scientific papers or proposal where people are just trying to find mistakes, find the trouble, find like, oh, yeah, I found a, a flaw here. I always felt like involved in or just the culture is different. It's like, yes, let's publish this. What's the best that you can make? Let's sit together and like, oh yeah, maybe if you improve this is strong, if you do that it's strong, but it's always in a positive way on the sense that we're going to do this. I don't know how long it'll take, but we're going to make it and we're going to make it together. I think this is fantastic for everyone involved, but for the scientific community as well, right? Another thing that's very important for me is the efficiency to be centric around developers, right? So it's instead of investing time on, on, on the document, let's invest time on the documentation of the software, which people, if the software is successful, this is what people are going to actually use and, and testing to be sure that's doing what is expected, people understand. So for us that are developing software, that's very efficient. I wouldn't say that's less work, but at least you feel that the work is all being put on the right place on, on things that will be useful for others. One final thing I, I mentioned before, I think it's, it's great to create the space to recognize software developers, scientific software developers, right? So now you have a publication, you have a DOI, and especially for the early career, they can show, look, this is what I did on the last years, and this is what I produced, and it's possible to track the scientific impact, right? If you go on, on Sour Mesh and look all the publications that, that use behind, you can see like, oh yeah, we are thankful for Luis to invest time on this because look how all the science that came behind. And maybe the funny ages can recognize more and more these and support more. I will say when I started my PhD, 
when I got review requests together with other people in the lab, we had a checklist that was not as complete as Joss, but every time I went to do a review of a paper, I would go check the repo and see, is the code available? Can I install this? Can I run the software? And so when Joss came around, I might be a bit too excited to jump and start volunteering to do reviews. So like during my PhD, I did a lot of JAWS reviews and that's also the reason why I'm wearing this sweater. I just noticed I that. I suddenly <laughs> saw the top of the logo. I was literally about to ask you. <laughs> I'm wearing surprise. a JAWS hoodie. It's very nice. I promised that I didn't send that to you. Or the... well, well, actually, it, I think you, I probably did because you you've reviewed so much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. a while ago. <laughs> yeah. It's very nice. Thank you for that. <laughs> so uh, it was always a focus for me. Science has to be reproducible, especially for the easier with a lot of quotes part of it, which is like software is something that we can run. We can go and do a long-term experiment again in the lab that will take 15 years to complete, but software has a much lower bar to reproduce what is being written and published. So I, I really like JAWS because of that. And also, again, like everyone already mentioned, on raising the bar for the usability of software because... I can't really oh, yeah. use a paper as a dependency on whatever I'm building. I can use software to do more scientific research and figure more things out. That's great. And I'd love to hear from you, Luis, also. What kind of skills do people need to contribute to the software? It's, it's open for contributions. So, yes, it's open for contributions. I will say that probably reading equations and translating to Rust is the largest part on, because one thing we didn't mention is that GSW has a lot of functions that end up being derived from these equations. How many are those? Like, it's more than 100 for sure. Yeah, 100 and chill. I, I, yeah, I counted that. And a, a, a big part of that is that there are some of the equations that are used more than others. So, like, we focus on the subset that the GSWC was implementing. There are some that even GSWC didn't implement based on the MATLAB reference implementation. So we still have some to finish implementing, but I would say that we also structure each function that we are implementing in a way that the function, the documentation and the tests are close to each other. So if you're coming to contribute, you have a lot of examples on how to help and how to do that translation. So pretty much like reading equations, translating that to Rust. It's a very C-like Rust. We are not doing too many fancy Rust things in the code base. And then attention to detail and patience because these equations can be quite long sometimes. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd say a lot of attention and, and, and patience. The priority here is to do the correct thing. Yeah, and we also set the developer infrastructure around, like we run all the tests in, in CI with GitHub Actions. We Yep. Also set up to replace JSWC in JSW Python when the R1 is not working that great yet, but we run the tests for JSW Python on top of our implementation to see if we are matching everything. So we try to go like taking great care of how the functions are implemented, that we are getting all the scientific parts right, and then evaluating across whatever we can that can use this and has tests to make sure that's also correct across languages. I was just going to say, it sounds like you're being incredibly diligent with this library, which sounds entirely appropriate for the type of work that you're doing. Also, I love that. It sounds like it's a nice contributor experience that you've got set up there with the code, the tests and the docs all together. So definitely sounds like this project is open for contribution. I wanted to close this out by just asking you both how People can keep up with your work online, keep up to date with your work. Are there any particular places you would want people to follow you or subscribe to your work? Luis, do you want to go first? Oh, I have a website up. It's called luiserber.org that has blog and talks that I give. I been lowering as much as possible my consumption of Twitter and likes. So I, I do have Mastodon and Blue Sky and Twitter accounts, but not very active over them. And what about yourself, Key? I'm a little bit limited on the on presence, and, but I have a, a website, castellon.net, and, uh, and Castellon is my handle in, in GitHub. I think it's the best way to track me and see what I'm, I'm doing. But I have a, one question for, for you both. Uh, how can we 
contribute to jazz. Like we already uh, do reviews and, and we read this stuff, but we really think that this is important thing. One of the risks that I see is that this is so great that everybody's seen that and is jumping in. How do we scale that and, and how can we help more than just review papers? Well, you playing a huge part by reviewing already and Louise is actually an editor at Just as well so he's double double helping there one of the sustainability challenges that we face as a journal is just not burning out reviewers and editors so I think the most concrete thing I could say is if you have thoughts on how to make reviewing or editing at Just a more sustainable process for the communities that you operate in that's always very welcome send us great editor suggestions when we do public calls for new editors because that happens semi-regularly we just closed that out uh, most recently in uh, in december and we're currently onboarding new new editors but yeah it's a great question thank you for the for the care and attention it's uh, it's appreciated i um i agree joss is, is important and uh, we wanted to thrive and survive uh, for a long time thank you thank you both yeah okay so i think team. abby do you want to join a wrap us up this was a very fun <laughs> conversation i enjoy all the swag <laughs> all of the logo <laughs> show-offs it was lovely chatting with you both and yeah best of luck with this work and i'm looking forward to seeing how it grows and how the community grows around it thank yeah. you thanks for your time both. thank you Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We'd love to showcase open source software built by researchers for researchers. So you can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arvin Smith and me, Abby Kubanak-Mays. Edited by Abby and the music is CC by Boxcat Games. Mm-hmm.